Thank you all for joining us for our November lunchtime webinar. If you haven't yet set up your audio, you want to do that now. Go to Tools and Audio and then Audio Setup. A bit of background. We started these monthly online forums a year ago in the hopes of giving alumni and friends ongoing access to some of the research and thinking here at the school. The webinars are designed to be part lecture, part discussion, so we will allow plenty of time for questions. If you do have a question, simply type it in the field at the bottom of the chat window. Also, please feel free to give us feedback using the emoticon. Today, Dr. Deborah Bliss will focus on how social media is helping redefine public health communication. Dr. Glick is director of the UCLA Health and Media Research Group and has over 30 years of experience conducting research on health behavior change and health communications. She will share firsthand accounts of social media projects with teens and young adults in the United States and in Africa and look at developments in disaster and risk communication. So let's get started. Deborah? Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. And I, I, I see a lot of names on here who I recognize. Um, and I do also want to make one disclaimer. As I got engaged in this, I realized that I'm going to give short shrift to the risk communication. I actually may have to come back and do a whole other lecture on that because that is a very interesting field. We'll touch on it. I'm really going to focus today on the bigger issues around communicating using new social media tools and techniques. Let me begin by just saying the area in which I've been working, public health communication, is one of the most dynamic areas of public health today. Now, that may be my own sensibility, but it is a moving target for those of you who are in this field. Um, and there are just many, many different areas. Um, there's social marketing, where we do campaigns to change health behavior. There's risk communication, which is about mainly disaster, disaster preparedness, emergency response. There's, of course, media advocacy and media relations, which are important tools that we use to change people's minds about things or to promote our own organizations. There's a huge growth industry in having public health people write journalistic articles, uh, which include video uh, documentaries. Uh, stories. There's another whole trajectory in regards to storytelling techniques. Entertainment education has become part of our um, toolbox. We also, of course, have been doing web-based communication for years, and now it's shifted into this Web 2 context. We continue to do print-based communication. And of course, coming right up is health and media literacy training. And then, of course, we do lots of training, again, using digital media. So it is a vast and sort of completely changing field, and Web 2 has actually changed everything that we do once again. And of course, I'm sure all of you are either members of communities or have done some Web2 kinds of applications or uses. There's instant messaging. There's personal profiles. There's sharing music videos, photos, art, poetry, stories. Um, sometimes we respond to things that we see on the news. Um, there was a very interesting news feed I saw today that people are thinking that a child safety campaign has gone too far, which is an ex excellent example of the changing definition of the audience here around news. We don't just get it anymore. We actually respond to it. There's Facebooking, Twittering, LinkedIn-ness. Uh, there's blogging, commenting, video gaming, uh, texting. So again, what's changed is that, if we look at the next slide, and I will say, um, we are less about doing sort of a, how can I say, one-way conversation where we disseminate messages and we have people um, amplify or um, 
communicate those messages to others. That's an older model. And now, with the advent of social media and Web2, we have people in the audience who are actually communicating the message, as well as um, perhaps those of us in public health who are also trying to communicate. So it's a cacophony, actually, now of voices, oftentimes. And what our role has morphed into is less of a source of information as a curator of the information that we hope gets out there um, and gets commented on. Uh, so we're, we're not just one way anymore. We're many ways. And our audience, who used to be um, sort of the receiver, is now actually part and participant in the communication process. So um, I actually stole this slide from a friend of mine, Nidra Weinrich, who does a lot of this work. And uh, thank you, Nidra. But basically, the people formerly known as the audience are now not only the relayers of information, but they're an integral part of creating and disseminating the messages themselves. And so that's really, it's sort of a 180-degree turn from what we used to do. Um, now, there's lots and lots of um, good information. Uh, if you haven't gotten on the Pew Internet and American Life listserv, definitely do so. They do wonderful studies. Um, and basically, this is a slide about uh, where people um, are in terms of their own um, web profiles. And this is young adults and older adults. And as you can see, obviously, there's Facebook, MySpace, and LinkedIn are the big three. And this is, in general, um, something that um, many, many adults do. But what we know is that kids do more of it. Okay, So you may think that all adults um, are on Facebook or LinkedIn or who share content. But actually, um, it's really teens who are even more likely to be participating in this new media world. So these are some uh, recent uh, results from a Pew study, I think it was 2009, 2006, that um, the kids who share, about 30 or 40 percent of kids share their own content online compared to adults. And one of the things we know about a lot of these studies and also having done some social media is that for every 100 people who might be on a Facebook or a LinkedIn or a social media website, only a very small percentage are active content creators. Some people will comment. Um, but only some people are the actual, what we call, lead communicators or dominant communicators in a network of users, uh, which is something that you want to consider. Because we've always known in health communication that there are people that we call opinion leaders um, or amplifiers. So it's the same phenomena in a social media network context. Uh, it's just. Uh, we have to learn how to work with those folks to help us if we're trying to do some kind of campaign or some kind of communication. And we need to support them when they do it. Uh, so again, it's not us versus them. It's we at this point. Um, in terms of remixing of content, another thing that people do in a social media website where they take other people's content and they use it for their own communication purposes, again, the point of this particular slide is that kids do more of it. So there's lots and lots of wonderful things that we can do. Um, again, more content sharing and remixing and blogging. Uh, teens as well as adults <coughs> do these things. Um, so what has happened uh, over the years, we've had many, many websites where people share um, their 
illness stories, their wellness stories. Uh, what's happened with Web2 is we now have much more public uh, places and also those that you can use with subscriptions to share your story. Um, this is an example of a place where people go and share their story about their fight with cancer, for example. Um, this is another way that we use social media. This is a house party uh, for an invisible children movement. Um, and we can actually post online where people are having house parties to support a particular uh, social activity. Um, we often now have mapping as part of what we do with social media. Uh, in addition, uh, we have Twittering. I don't know how many of you Twitter uh, or follow people on Twitter. But uh, we have this sort of immediate mobile messaging uh, capacity now that we can actually um, get messages out into the media and get feedback. Uh, this is an example of somebody who's communicating about a uh, potential um, acute illness emergency. Um, and so we have this immediate instant messaging phenomena that's going on as well. And of course, we have other kinds of um, apps and um, social media types of uh, tools to help us quit smoking or go on a diet or tell other people what we're doing. So again, a lot of what used to be perhaps uh, information that we didn't share quite so readily except with our close friends now is something that um, we can, if we choose, share, um, or um, we certainly have lots and lots of information about staying healthy. Um, now, one of the things that we also do a lot with the social media is not just use it to communicate or to give people tips or to help people overcome an illness. We also have a a very large sort of endeavor of monitoring the media to help us understand what types of things are going on in the health environment. This is a Twitter um, feed that has to do with flu. So in addition to actually pushing out information, the social media also helps us to understand what might be going on in a particular time and place. Um, and certainly, uh, it doesn't replace sentinel surveillance systems, but it gives us an idea of the kinds of things that might be going on in a particular population um, in a particular time and place. Again, uh, we're all in the process of learning how to use these tools. Uh, I'm not going to say that anybody has a um, handle on this. However, I will make a statement and say that just as in social marketing we tend to follow advertising in regards to our skill set, uh, the same thing is going on now in public health. Social marketers have used social media much more readily than we have and, and have learned how to use it. So often what we're learning about is through our um, colleagues in advertising and marketing. So um, what I want to talk about are some projects that I've been working on with colleagues uh, here at UCLA and also at HealthNet um, with um, a website that we created for teens with teens. Um, it's called www.t2x.me. And we had started with another title, Teen to Extreme. It turned out it really wasn't a very good title, and we shortened it considerably. And this project grew out of a need to try to understand um, how teens use health care. We worked for a number of months with uh, people at HealthNet of California. Um, this is back in 2008. 
um, to try to understand what their needs were in terms of getting their uh, beneficiaries engaged in their health care. And um, just FYI, a number of kids, many kids in California have health care insurance and also a usual source of care. Um, but oftentimes, these kids don't necessarily know how to use their health care and how to use their preventive health care. They don't know necessarily that they need to get referrals, get forms filled out, or even um, how to make an appointment. And what we did was we decided, let's do a social media website to actually see if we can encourage kids to learn more about their health care. Now, those of you who have worked with adolescents know that doing health ed or health communication with teens um, is not always easy. They're interested in some things. And um, those things typically have to do with their own personal health issues like sex or drugs or weight loss. Um, talking about preventive health care isn't the most interesting thing um, that a teen might want to get involved in. And so what we did is we actually got some money from NIH and we set about working to create a website that could engage teens. And what I'm going to tell you now is just some of the things we've learned. Because like many who are embarking on something that they know very little about, um, we found only certain things worked with these teens. Now the teens we were working with were health net insured teens who were on Medi-Cal uh, or Medicaid and healthy families or SHIP programs. Um, and so in general, they may be the first one in their family who has health insurance. Um, and what we ended up doing were many, many activities. We did polls. We did quizzes. We did chats. We did contests. And what we found is only certain social media bells and whistles seem to work. One of the things that we're very happy that we finally did is we did some storytelling. We um, had a subcontractor, Michael Fiore from EPG Technologies, who built the site for us. Um, and basically, um, we decided we need to have a little bit of a drama going on here and some interesting um, narrative to get these kids engaged. So we actually subbed out to a teen theater group and basically they came up with a improvisational a docu, a, well, a mockumentary style um, presentation where we have webisodes, mini webisodes that have to do with teen health issues. So this is, um, you see a picture, you're welcome to go on the site and actually look at all the club episodes. We have four posted now, I believe. Um, so basically, uh, this is an actor who's playing a doctor who's talking to a teen about mononucleosis. What we basic premise of this was that it was a health club after school, um, and there were kids who were there voluntarily, and then there were kids who were there because they had to be there because they were caught smoking or doing some other awful thing. So it takes place in a school. And it basically is trying to use not just a narrative storytelling technique, but a blog or a transmedia approach where the characters themselves, Allison is the club president, actually has a question and answer blog. Um, other characters in this also blog. So the point here is that kids on this website have profiles, but they also have the ability to respond or not respond or post opinions, post their own videos, post their own stuff, as well as respond to the stuff that we're putting out there. Now, let me also say that this is a website that's only for kids who are 13 through 17, so it's a very controlled space, which a lot of kids like. Uh, there are a lot of kids whose parents don't let them go on Facebook. 
um, for various reasons. So this is a nice alternative. Um, and in addition to blogs, we also have um, posts. So again, the idea here is we have real people on this site, and we also have characters. And um, the kids can comment on the webisodes. They can comment on what we're talking about. Um, they can comment on anything they would like to. So again, this is just um, an example. You can, as I said, go on the site and actually look at it um, yourself. Uh, you can't post anything because you're just a tourist, but you would have to be let in to get on it. And the kids like the fact that this is their own site. Um, other things that we found that the kids loved were chats. So unlike a webinar where I'm talking um, and I will be responding hopefully at the end of this to questions, what we did in this site is we actually had an expert, usually a physician, come and talk about something that the kids seem to be interested in. So we have a um, wonderful uh, doctor who knows how to talk to teens about sex. And it's all online. It's at usually uh, 7 or 8 at night. Um, it's usually an hour in length. And we'll have an expert who will start talking about a topic. And then the teens will post in questions. So essentially, it's like a, a live radio call-in show, except it's uh, online. And it's anonymous. Um, all the kids have um, monikers. They don't necessarily use it. We, in fact, we discourage people from using their real name. Uh, so it allows people to get immediate feedback to questions they might have about a particular topic, as well as um, uh, you know, hear what other people are saying. Um, what we found is, in addition to the um, the transmedia and the club episodes, the chats are a very popular thing with kids. Uh, and we've typically done them through classrooms. We've done chats on infectious disease. We've done chats on bullying, on sex, um, talking to your doctor about embarrassing things, uh, and we have done some stuff on nutrition. Um, so again, our idea here is how do you engage kids in a conversation and use that as, as part of the thing that drives the health communication. So again, it's a participatory process. It is not a, a top-down, do this, do that anymore. It's always about a conversation or creating a dialogue or, or creating some ways that your audience can participate in a meaningful way. That's what's different about social media. Uh, we also have done some mini campaigns on this project. Uh, we did one this summer on whooping cough because that was timely. Uh, and we were able to do some text alerts. A lot of these kids do texting. There's some recent articles that suggest that teens text 3,000 or more texts a month, which I, I find hard to believe. But um, if you watch teens, um, they don't do email. Uh, they answer phones occasionally, but they're texting a lot of the time. Uh, so this was uh, basically. Um, a way that we had to communicate a very um, current and timely topic, which was that kids needed to get whooping cough shots before they could go back to school this summer. Um, and the final thing that we did in this particular project that did seem to get kids engaged was a contest. You'll see a lot of these uh, now on the web that people are asked to participate by um, donating their own videos and their own blogs and their own articles. And we had a T2X Expression Awards, which was posters and videos and poetry and songs. And again, the idea was to get people involved and get people voting um, and have them engaged in, in this endeavor. Now, um, and that was, uh, they could have won, somebody won an iPod, iPad, excuse me. Um, and it, it made our site very busy. So nutrition, context, chats, 
um, these are the things that get kids um, interested. But what was our underlying idea here? Uh, as I said before, basically, when you're doing this kind of communication, you're not just looking at your underlying theme or message. You have to get people engaged in an activity. And our idea here was that we started with activities. And that had to do with all of these things, um, individual profiles and photos and blogs being uploaded. Then there were a number of activities that we did that got this community of users, and that's really what it is. It's a social network of users um, actually interacting with each other. And then we had other kinds of things like polls and shouts, uh, trivia, opinion prompts. And finally, what we did to get other kinds of information flowing in this community was to you know, sponsor chats, transmedia, mini campaigns, contests. So we initiated certain activities, but there were already ongoing activities on the site um, that, that were um, engaging the kids. Um, essentially, we had themes. And the, the themes in black are the ones that we actually did. We had a whole list of things that we were going to use to get kids engaged. Um, in this site, and we basically um, did what we could. Um, kids are interested in appearance. They are interested in stress. They are interested in infectious disease. Um, we even had one uh, chat about water rights. So there are kids who are interested in social justice and food justice and environmental justice. We oftentimes engage kids through school. So it, were, it was pre-existing communities. Um, we also, as I said, had our health net kids as well. Um, and all of these activities and themes really were feeding into our underlying um, agenda, which was to try to get kids to appreciate why it was important to understand their health care benefits and navigate the health care system and get preventive care and understand what their rights and responsibilities were. Um, did we get to some of that? Yes. But again, um, we had to do a lot of other things before we could actually even begin to get to these things. And um, in general, if you are going to do a social media website like any campaign, there are many, many layers that you have to go through before you can get people engaged in the topic. Um, Basically, because this is an NIH research grant, we had a very fancy research design. Um, I, I can't tell you it was particularly uh, a great uh, study. It's been very um, interesting to do an NIH RCT alongside a social media campaign. Um, let's just say. It, it's, it's research, and we are getting uh, our second wave of data uh, at this point, and we will have something to say at the end of this in terms of effectiveness. Um, so you know, what we've learned from this is doing research and doing social media are two different things. There's been a lot of delays because of uh, our IRB, our Institutional Review Board didn't completely understand what we were doing. And that has been an interesting process to educate people. Um, what we've learned in terms of creating a site like this is a lot of kids are saying, well, what is this site? Um, because they are, remember, bombarded all over the place and at all times by marketing and other kinds of social media. So we did have to be very honest right from the get-go that this was a UCLA uh, Health Net funded site and it was you know, to improve health and it wasn't to sell anything. Um, we did find that working with pre-existing communities um, was a help to get us up to the numbers that we needed to make a viable site. You need at least three to 500 people on a site to make it um, work because everybody isn't active all the time. And people go on these sites not just to read stuff, but to see what other people are doing. Um, 
we found that there is a huge amount of competition out there for people's time and attention. And um, we would do these chats, and sometimes we do it on Tuesday. And of course, all the kids in our target group seem to be watching TV or watching Glee. So we had to be very careful about when and what we were doing. Um, in terms of um, you know, adolescents, just I, I'm going to say they don't necessarily check their email. Um, it's best to text them, but then you have to get their phone number. Um, there's all kinds of issues around communicating with this particular crowd, even if they are in your um, insurance plan uh, that are not always obvious. Um, they're a hard audience to reach out to. And um, basically, the other thing that we found is because this was a subscriber-only site, um, sometimes we'd lose kids just in the process of getting them signed up. Like many, many sites, it was 70% girls. And they were the heavy contributors to the site in terms of the profiles and all of this other stuff. We are continuing to um, work with this site and develop it. And uh, we are, I'm going to put a plug in, looking for sponsors. Um, so if anybody is interested, um, please get in touch with me. But this is the cast of characters who helped work on this. And so again, um, it's been live for about a year and a half, and we want to keep it live. Um, I want to say that you know this is an American context. We made a lot of assumptions about American kids. But a couple of years ago, I also had the um, opportunity and I, I want to say the privilege of working with a group in Senegal, uh, the Reyes Project, on Campaign Sinukadu. Um, I think I saw that Philip Massey is on the line who helped work on this. Um, basically, we made many assumptions um, about uh, American kids when we did the T2X, that they already know how to do a YouTube video and they know how to post a blog. We didn't make those assumptions when we started this project. Uh, this was done in Dakar, Senegal. We started in 2008. And it was a comprehensive health ed campaign. Um, and what we did is we worked with high schools. And it was a grant we got from OCWA, Open Society Institute of West Africa. And we did peer education and school-based clubs and trained kids to create their own messages about HIV and reproductive health. And the first um, sort of layer was to do this in an interpersonal context. Um, we also created a campaign, and I, I, I will say I didn't create it. Alex Rideau, who heads Reyes, created it. Um, basically, it was a youth-generated HIV campaign called Our Voices, or Our Words, in Wolof. And what it was is these kids who were trained in HIV prevention were also trained in media production. There was a, a, a studio. Um, in which the kids learned how to shoot videos, use cell phones to create uploadable materials, um, and basically a campaign um, that encouraged kids to contribute to a contest that was held in January of 2010 um, in which kid generated messages around preventing um, HIV and other reproductive health issues um, was the focus. Um, there was also an HIV testing service, because one of the issues in this part of Africa is getting kids tested, um, and a texting service where kids could actually send in questions and get answers. So it used mobile messaging. It used um, um, youth-generated content, it used peer education to create a participatory model around health education, which at the time was actually quite novel. Um, we had uh, three high schools in Dakar who were um, uh, had these uh, peer-educated kids. 
And we found that in the three big high schools, um, participation varied. In the biggest high school, there was less participation than the two smaller high schools. Um, we actually were able to do a, an evaluation. Uh, we had uh, surveys done in 2008, and then we came back in March of 2010, and we did some actual follow-up. Um, what we did find is like 40 or 50 percent of the kids in most of these schools did have access to um, internet, um, either in cyber cafes, at school, at home. Again, these were more middle class kids. They might not be, um, you know, typical of rural kids. But um, I was just on the phone yesterday uh, with. Uh, my colleagues in the car, and they're saying that 45% of youth now throughout uh, Senegal have at least weekly access to the internet. So it is changing um, all over the world. Um, this is probably a very dense table. Um, Philip Massey put this together. And I just want to say what we did learn is it did have an impact. Um, having uh, exposure to this campaign and to these messages did seem to change um, kids' awareness of um, testing for HIV, the importance of testing. Um, yes, girls were more receptive to boys, but that's always the case. And the kids who were more engaged in um, using digital media and ICTs were the ones who were more impacted. Uh, so again, I think this is um, a phenomenon now that's happening all over the world. Um, well, you can look at these slides yourselves. I'm going to hurry now because I want to get to questions. Um, but just let me say, um, there's just many, many tools now that we can use um, to engage people and provide health information. Uh, there's Twittering. There's Facebooking. Uh, there's many people now who use these tools to promote particular health um, uh, and communication um, information. Uh, there's LinkedIn uh, as another form of professional networking and information sharing. Um, what we did in both Sunukadu and at T2X.me was we created dedicated sites. We created our own sites. Um, and that was for a very specific audience. Um, and we we're using those to build awareness about social issues that were germane to those audiences. But that's only one approach. Uh, many now are using other uh, more generic types of social media to get whatever their issue is out there. Um, and of course, there are blogs. Um, and people like blogs. They like the interactivity of blogs. And so again, um, the idea here is there's many, many tools that we have. But all of what is done has to be engaging and interactive and allow people to respond, uh, or it doesn't work. Um, now, I was going to say something more about risk communication, but let me just say social media is being used in both emergency preparedness and response. Just three examples of preparedness. Uh, I don't know how many of you are here for Ar Carmageddon, but definitely Twitter was used to tell us uh, about what to do and not do. Uh, if you go on to um, the sites, um, Basically, they told us uh, there were tools that were downloadable to help people map out their routes. There was advice. Uh, I don't know how many of you were um, familiar with the zombie apocalypse uh, campaign that came out of CDC in May. Again, it was a preparedness campaign that used social media tools to get people engaged in um, getting ready for disasters. And of course, um, the granddaddy here is the Great California Shakeout that just happened on October 20th. This is the fourth year the Shakeout has happened. Um, I helped do some of the original um, evaluation, but one of the big tools that they use is social media, where people actually register and then can participate in giving feedback and post pictures and videos and comments after the shakeout occurs and before the shakeout occurs. So this is an amazing uh, 
movement in which a campaign has morphed into a drill, which has used social media, which creates a participatory um, type of um, responsiveness to doing something about risk. Uh, the same thing has happened in regards to response and recovery efforts. I s basically, since I did this slide the other day, I had 10 more sites. But if you look at the response to the Haiti earthquake last year, um, basically there were many, many groups that used uh, social media and Twitter and uh, Facebook to get help to not only the victims, but the people who are helping the victims. Uh, if you look at recent fires or recent disasters in California, the way that now oftentimes we're orienting um, some assistance has to do with monitoring Twittering sites to find out uh, where things are happening, to hear from people what's going on. So it's moving away from just formalized reporting and surveillance systems to actually what we call these informal social media sites. Same thing with Hurricane Irene. With the Japanese tsunami, we have not only on the ground um, reports that were going on, uh, but also stories of victims, stories of survivorship. Um, assistance uh, to the victims through using social media or other uh, types of, um, uh, well, mainly social media types of um, applications. So um, all of these um, new media are, are, again, changing how we think about um, disasters, both the preparedness side and the response and recovery side, uh, and, and really helping create more resilience in our communities. Um, so I, I don't want to say too much more. As I said, I could do a whole other lecture just on social media in disasters. But um, there's lots and lots of trends going on. There's a big movement, particularly among youth, towards mobile media, towards texting. Um, and that's particularly true in, in not just our culture, but also the developing world, um, where uh, satellite download um, basically helps people with their communication technology. Um, but what we found also with all of these, uh, both of these studies and others, is that you have to do something comprehensive. You have to touch people in multiple ways. What we found with our T2X teens is, yeah, we could send them text messages and we could do emails, but we also did Christmas cards and um, holiday cards. And sometimes uh, to break through the clutter of all this texting and email and digital stuff, you do have to do something else uh, to get them engaged. Um, in terms of actually changing people, I can say, having just um, done some stuff in East Los Angeles with many, many levels of outreach, to actually change behavior, you can't just do social media. It's also good to do some in-person teaching. And it's also good to do some social action. And it's also good to do many, many things. So like all health behavior change types of initiatives, it isn't just one thing that's going to, there's no magic bullet here. You've got to do a lot of things, and you've got to do it for a long time. So um, I think we're at the end here, and it would be great to have some questions. Uh, Deb, I first just want to thank you so much. Um, we will have you back for a complete uh, webinar on disaster <laughs> and risk communication. Um, we do have time for questions. So if you just type your question in the field at the bottom of the chat window, um, we, can, we can get going on that. And while we wait for people to do that, Deb, let's start out. I'd like to get your thoughts on whether or what you think about organizations and health departments blocking employees from using social media websites. 
have to say, I, I find it very backwards thinking. I hope this is not politically incorrect. I do think it's good if organizations have rules and regs about how people should use these things. Obviously, you don't want people doing their personal Facebook account at work. But unfortunately, the world is moving towards using these things for professional communications and risk communications. Uh, I know we're blocked at UCLA from Twitter. Um, which, unless you put your VPN on, you can't get there. And yet there are lots and lots of important things going on um, on these sites now. So I think, um, I think organizations need to really think this through. And yes, put some restrictions on how employees use it. But to block these sites altogether, um, it's just it's just not a good idea. We have a couple questions here. The first is from Andrea. She wants to know how do you determine who the opinion leaders are and how do you engage them? Okay, a very good question. Basically, the way we've done it on our T2X, for example, is those kids who were the most active. So the opinion leaders were the ones a who do the most posting and B, who have the most friends. So now, the, the bigger issue is can those opinion leaders actually get engaged in amplifying the message? Well, on a kid website, that's a little tricky because you don't want to overwhelm people with requests. But you can incentivize and ask um, those kids to do some things um, sometimes or help get some, some things organized. Um, in a larger context, um, obviously, uh, if you were doing organizational or community engagement, people or groups that are community la leaders or liaisons are those groups that have more social connectivity. And so again, um, that might be a cue for you to perhaps pump, uh, pump more information or ask those groups to do some dissemination for you. Of course, you have to incentivize that. Um, so again, it's not that hard to figure out in a social media context. Um, Kelly um, says that several of the outreach techniques you know are post methods of dissemination, Twitter, blogs, podcasts. Any feedback on poll methods from the participants, uh, changes to websites, chat rooms, etc.? Um, well, I think that, you know, I haven't personally um, done much of that. I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, you mean, poll methods in terms of like a Wikipedia type of context or Toxipedia where people actually contribute to creating um, information? Is that is that what the context is? Or I mean poll in a sense of if people are contributing blogs or um, videos is I guess I'm I'm sort of questioning. I know Ke Kelly. What do you mean? <laughs> she can get back to us. Let's take the next one, and then maybe Kelly will clarify. <laughs> um, Sanji says that the last slide said teens don't always latch on to the latest thing, which she says seems antithetical to our understanding. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. Um, what I mean by that is um, we went into the social media world in our with our teens thinking that. We could only um, use social media or web two or text texting types of communications, and yet what we found is that in fact teens also like to get stuff. Uh, they liked cards. They liked actual print materials, and they don't like everything um, just um, to be digital. And so that sort of when I say they don't always um, just want new stuff, they also are fine with some older forms of communication. That's what I meant. Another question, Deb. In your evaluation, do you expect the greatest impact on knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, or actual behavior change? Well, I think it's um, like everything else. Um, it's much easier to change knowledge than it is to change attitudes, than it is to change behaviors. Um, it doesn't take that much to change what a person knows. It takes some more effort to change attitudes. Um, 
And behavior is the hardest thing to change. Um, we know that media and communication only can go so far in changing social norms and changing what is expected. Some people are more receptive than others, but it's only when those around you begin to change and change their behavior that you see really significant changes. Um, so I think the interest in using social networks um, and using this concept of a community of engaged people um, is to sort of play on the power of group process and uh, group dynamics. I don't think we're mastering this at all at this point, but it is going back to Lewin, who talked about this back in the 40s and 50s when they were interested in getting people to change their behavior. And there's always the sense that it's the social um, seen around one that really is the essence of behavior change. And if you can push that a bit, you get those changes. So um, maybe this a roundabout way of, of saying that, yes, ultimately behavior will change. Um, it's not something that happens that quickly. And you have to have these very comprehensive approaches. Um, to getting that to happen. Pandu has a question and is joining us from Indonesia. It wants to know, uh, social media sometimes increases misunderstanding and misperception on the accurate issues that they are interested in. What's your opinion about that? Uh, uh, yes, it does. I mean, let's go back to the H1N1 um, outbreak, uh, which was originally called swine flu. Um, there were very much, um, there was a very um, good response to that on the part of um, risk communicators. Um, and yet people still believe that um, swine were causing the flu. Um, they actually rebranded uh, swine flu right in the middle of it to call it H1N1 to take the onus off of swine being the cause. However, there were countries in which they slaughtered pigs because they thought that was the cause of the flu. Um, so one of the things, and this is really a risk communication technique that now um, systematically goes on um, in regards to emergency risk communication is one has to um, have a group that monitors the media. And if misinformation or rumors are being floated, there actually are whole techniques now to actually um, counter those with other messages and or um, you know discount false information but but that is that is an issue Brenda wants to know if you can elaborate a bit more on how you were able to work with the IRB we had to be patient <laughs> um, I think one of the problems that we had with our institutional review board was that they had difficulty getting their heads around um, issues of privacy um, in regards to our social media intervention. And um, so we had to really work very hard to educate them about the fact that not only was this a subscription-only site, that only kids with certain attributes could join, but that we also um, did have rules and regs that um, if people were sharing inappropriate information that they could be uh, blocked from the site. Um, we also had to give assurances, for example, that um, you know, we would do our best to keep, quote unquote, lurkers and predators out of the site. So from an intervention perspective, we had to really um, do a lot of work with our IRB about educating them about the safeguards that we had on the site. Um, the other issue, of course, was um, just generic IRB issues that have to do with asking teens about personal health behavior. Um, that's always an issue um, with IRBs. Um, I do think, you know, I, I've done a number of projects since we put this one in, and I have seen um, a more of an appreciation of, 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 of using these tools. Um, but it was an interesting process. We were delayed about a year 
um, because of our IRB um, and getting this thing started. Uh, Sanji says you mentioned the notion of obtaining three to five hundred community members to ensure a thriving community. Can you share some of your successful strategies to recruit the first three to five hundred? Right. Well, again, what we've we've done numerous things. Um, one of the things that we did right from the get go was the contest to get people engaged. Um, basically, we did what we call polls. We did um, uh, quizzes. We did trivia games. Um, the idea being that we sent invitations out to a lot of kids. Kids will go on to your site, but if it's not something that engages them right away, they won't come back. So getting people to the site is less sometimes the issue than keeping people on the site or getting them to register on the site. People are very hesitant these days to actually register on the site. Again, there's a lot of sites out there and the registering makes you feel that perhaps somebody wants something from you. Um, so you have to get their attention immediately and keep them on and keep them going through. So one of the reasons we did the transmedia was to get kids to actually get engaged with a little drama and want to come back and do it. Um, so it's not like web one where you, you can just put a, an informational site up and think that somebody's going to come back unless it's an amazing site that has lots and lots of information um, that you could use for your schoolwork. Um, but this is true with adults too. I mean, how many websites do you go to? How many do you actually bookmark? How many do you go back to? You're basically going to bookmark and go back to those sites that, that tell you something that nobody else can tell you or that gets you engaged or that makes you laugh. So it's the same thing. Yeah, I'm wondering in the, in the last uh, couple minutes that we have left, if you could comment on what you think the best way to train health professionals uh, to use these types of communication tools. Um, really important question. I think all health communication professionals today not just should understand the basic principles of communication, but should really take a training course. I would like to take a training course in how to use Twitter. Um, I, I, I would like to take a training course in how to use um, Facebook. Um, it's not always intuitive in terms of how you might use this for a campaign. Um, there are clearly um, some online training uh, tools out there and toolkits. Um, it would be good to have um, maybe some um, sort of, I, I want to say it would be nice to have one place to go where it had sort of all these tools and ways to use them um, clearly, clearly demarcated. So I think that not only do you have to understand how to do campaigns and how to create messages and how to understand your audience, but we definitely need to move the training along to incorporate social media techniques. Well, Deb, thank you so much. We are out of time. Um, thank everybody for joining us for this really interesting webinar. We're going to take a break over the holidays and continue the conversation on January 11th with Steve Wallace. He'll be discussing his research on economic and health security for the elderly. If you have ideas for future webinars, please type your suggestions on the screen or email us. And if you missed any of our previous webinars, they are all available on the school's website. Uh, please allow a few days for this one to post. Thanks again to Deb, and thank you all. Have a great day.